what I've learned over time is in the venture business, you always have to look at what could this company be, not what could go wrong. And I think too often we get caught up in the what could go wrong. You know, eventually it, those have come back to bite me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Zero to Exit. This is Ankur and Nalima, your hosts. So far on this podcast, we have talked to builders and buyers. On today's show, we're going to talk to an investor to help understand what separates a good entrepreneur from a great one and how the high stakes venture business works. We're fortunate to have Mark Fernandez with us. Mark is a managing partner at Sierra Ventures, an early stage VC firm that specializes in enterprise and emerging tech companies. Sierra Ventures has had a long and illustrious history of investing in great companies that have consistently seen great outcomes, including 100 plus IPOs. Mark hit a homer in his first ad bat when his first ever investment in Sourcefire paid off bigly when it was acquired by Cisco for $2.7 billion in 2013. This was at a time when a billion plus exit was a big deal. Since then, Mark has invested in several companies that have been acquired by Microsoft, VMware, Palo Alto Networks, and others. I've personally known Mark through Redlock for over three years, and I can tell you that he's one of the most cerebral, thoughtful, and startup-friendly investor I've ever met. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the show. Hi, Ankur. Hi, Nalima. To kick things off, Mark, tell us a little bit about your childhood and upbringing. I read somewhere that you dropped out of the medical school or you were about to go to a medical school. Tell us more about it. Sure. You know, I grew up in India, grew up in Bombay and middle class family thought I was uh, either going to be an engineer or a doctor because my older brothers were in engineering. I said, I want to be a doctor. I showed up to medical school the first day, saw a lot of blood, turned around and left. Ended up uh, <laughs> just uh, heading back home, asking my dad what I should do. And I think I just joined my brother in a little engineering school called Manipal. Uh, my brother's classmate, much, you know, as I found out later on, was Satya Nadella. So I was fortunate to be surrounded by some really smart people at Manipal. I was a mechanical engineer and and then, uh, you know, did that and decided to come to Berkeley for grad school. I did my master's in robotics at Berkeley. And then we can talk about the rest of my career. But it's uh, it's been a bunch of left turns to get to the right turn. But uh, yeah, that's that's a little bit about my story. You had mentioned, Mark, that coming to U.S. in 90s, you basically had nothing and the first year was very hard. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So when I came to Berkeley, you know, I didn't know any better. I was just fortunate to be at a school like Berkeley doing my uh, master's in robotics there. And, you know, the the very first year, I I think I had a bike uh, and the gears didn't shift on that bike. And Berkeley is a very hilly uh, campus. I had a desk and a sleeping bag, and I think, uh, and I lived on the border of Oakland and Berkeley with four other grad students. So it was a very interesting time, but you you don't know better. And um, for me, it was just, it was all about taking advantage of the opportunity. And it taught me a lot about uh, life and life lessons for much later on. And so it was great because I had an opportunity to learn from some of the best professors at Berkeley, and, and even my classmates were incredibly brilliant uh folks in grad school so it, it was it was great and you didn't think about the rest but sometimes you wonder you know if that hunger that that comes from basically essentially i would call it surviving at the time was really critical and and it stayed with me for a long time even even now with all the luxuries and stuff that come along with the uh you know the business i, I feel like you never forget those early days. And, and I really think that's super important to keep that hunger. And we look for that when we talk to entrepreneurs. We know when somebody has a chip on their shoulder and they need to do something, that, that hunger always shows. Yep. And you call yourself an accidental VC. After the grad school, you started working at Seagate, then went to B school, and then ended on Wall Street. From there, how did the venture business transformation happen? Yeah. So, I mean, even if you play it back a little bit, Nilima, I, you know, after uh, I was tired of the whole being an engineer for a little while, so I thought I'd go to business school. And so when I went to business school, I thought I was going to go back to Cisco. I'd done a little project with them and, um, you know, I thought I was going to go back to Cisco and and ended up during the recruiting at business school. Uh, the next table over was an investment bank, ended up 
you know, talking to them and becoming a sell side research analyst. And I didn't even know what investments banks did. And, you know, I ended up covering a lot of the fortunate to cover a lot of the big security software companies, storage software companies back in the time and in the early uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And one of the companies I took public, um, so I was at Merrill Lynch, and one of the companies I took public was a Sierra Ventures company, Micromuse. And, you know, the Sierra guys were at a Merrill conference. They came up to me and started talking. I didn't know what venture capital really did at the time because I was I was doing 80, 90-hour work weeks as a Wall Street guy and uh, ended up uh, talking to these guys, really liked the team and uh, joined Sierra back in 2002. So it took me three lefts to make a right turn. Yeah, pretty pretty incredible. You know, investment banking is also about investing and finding the right company and venture business is the same. Was there specific about Sierra's pitch that kind of drew you in? It Was it like just you were in Berkeley in Silicon Valley, so technology was the thing back then? Is that what sort of drew you in? Yeah, you know, it, it was. And it was, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was every company was going public. I mean, if you think back to the companies that were going out now are very large companies, whether it's F5 Networks or, you know, I used to cover Verisign and Veritas and some of these gigantic companies. And now some of them have even gone private like Symantec, right? And so for me, it was it was fun, but it was also the right time in life. If I look at my career, it's been chunked up into four, three pieces of probably, you know, the first two or four or five years stints, product management and engineering, then business school. And then I did my Wall Street thing, my sell side research, which is very different from investment banking. It was very, you know, the network, you deal with some of the top, you know, CEOs of these companies and all. And so for me, venture capital was very interesting because it was basically doing what I did as a sell side research analyst covering public companies. I was now doing it in the private world. And it was the same thing as stock picking, right? As a sell side research guy, you're, you're telling people whether to buy or sell stocks. And I think the yep. same thing here, except you're putting your money where your mouth is in venture capital. And so for me, it was doing more of the same and just doing it at the private level with, you know, with our investors and my own money, too. So I think that was the difference. And that also, you know, that perspective is, as covering software and covering security at Merrill gave me that perspective that led into Sourcefire because that was um, and we can talk about that in more detail, but it was being able to see how to disrupt the security market with open source. So I think that was the progression from, call it, public company stocks to private company stocks is what that transition was. Even though on the surface it seemed very different, it was it was similar in many, many ways. It was stock picking. I'm always curious about folks who were here during the early stages of the internet revolution and the making of the Silicon Valley. Back in the days as an individual, like, did you... Did you have any predictions? Did you ever think that we're going to see a 2020 and a technology boom the way we do? Like, did you, was any of this kind of within your line of sight or or this is all blown through all expectations? Yeah, but every cycle is is different and every plateau seems to be a lot higher than the previous one, right? So, I mean, you know, look, when, when I was going through this, this was the first internet wave, right? It was Amazon was just getting going and you know, the late nineties and, you know, a lot of the e-commerce had just started, but it was, it would, we had kind of gone from the client server to the internet world. Right. And, and then the next phase was kind of in the 2008, 2009, after that crisis, you know, we kind of saw uh, the next wave and mobile, you know, definitely took off at that time. I think, you know, every, every cycle has been, it has been a cycle, but at the end of the day, the plateaus have gotten a lot higher. Right. And so the bar has gotten a lot higher. The transformations happen. And I, the way I would describe 2020 is you know, I was talking one of our we have our CXO summit and one of the folks executives from Microsoft. I asked him this question. I said, is this the biggest transformation? And he said, yes, but it's also the most rapid. Right. I think what's happened this year has been just to expedite everything. Things that were in innovation labs, you know, moved into production in nine months, right? And so I feel like this is definitely, while it's, you know, obviously the biggest, but it's the most rapid. And, you know, could anybody have seen it? I don't think so. I mean, people know that the trend lines are always up and to the right, but it's the slope of the curve. And I think the slope of this curve has definitely been accelerated by the pandemic, so. 
Mark, you had uh, some very interesting roommates when you were in B school, and uh, some of them are real good friends even now. Uh, how did your time spent in B school help your point of view? Yeah, actually, well, my roommate was before business school. Is actually the guy who started uh, Kirti Melkote, who started Aruba Networks, and you know, I think it just um, and he worked for the you know, CEO of Arista Networks, Jai Shrilal. And, and so it's it's always, uh, you always try to surround yourself with good people. I think what business school was different was for me transitioning from product management or engineering into the business world. I really, you know, if you think about what Simon Sinek says, it's like the why, the what, and the how. I definitely knew the how. <laughs> I occasionally knew the what, and I never knew the why, right? And I for me, it was when I... Uh, went to business school, it was much about learning the why more than anything else. And I felt like coming out of that, especially going to Wall Street, the real trick was understanding the why, why these companies were going to be big companies, you know. And so I think that transition from the what, the the, the how, the what and the why really kind of happened through business school and through the people around because my friends and classmates and all were all, you know, people who came from very diverse backgrounds, right? Not only were there gender diversity and ethnic diversity, but they came from around the world. I mean, I remember my circle of friends were from Malaysia, Australia, Ireland, you know, a couple of Silicon Valley people, but it was that diversity in thinking was critical. And that allowed me to shape, you know, the second half of my career, as I would describe it. Great insights. We will go into now a little bit of how the venture business works, uh, demystifying the details around that. Uh, perhaps we can start with the process of raising money. How does that process work when you're raising a new fund? We know that you just raised your 12th fund. So yeah. if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, look, I think venture capital is, is quite a simple formula, right? If you think about what Amazon philosophy is inputs versus outputs, it's like, our investors give us money and we're supposed to provide a good multiple on it and give them good returns at the end of the day. Very simple investment philosophy, I think. But at the end of the day, for the fundraising part of it, which is your question, look, we have chosen to be on the smaller end of the spectrum because we like the seeds and A's and the early end of the spectrum. We've had bigger funds in the past, but we really feel like the best, we're the stage in our careers where we really like the first to be the first institutional investor in. So fundraising for us has been, you know, because our fund size is, you know, 200, 250 is kind of what we set ourselves to goal. It's been pretty straightforward. And so our investors are probably a mix of institutional investors like pension funds or university endowments and some strategic investors. So we do have some corporate investors uh, who provide us some very good perspectives into newer trends and technologies. But for us, it's, you know, every three years or three and a half years, we go out and raise, you know, this amount of money. Uh, we deploy that capital over, you know, a three-year period. And then the life, I mean, as you know, it's uh, these companies sometimes take seven to 10 years. And so the investment horizon for these funds are about seven to 10 years. And so uh, while we invest the initial check in that three year time frame, it's, you know, it's deployed over a seven to 10 year or we kind of have to work with these companies for seven to 10 years. So our investors are pretty patient. You know, they, they view this as they're very sophisticated about, you know, why they're investing in venture capital. This is a small portion of their portfolio, but it's been the best returns uh, in many, many cases for them. Right. And, and so we, you know, we've been fortunate as a 12th fund to be, you know, have a very good roster of investors that we've worked with for a period of time. But yeah, that's hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does. And and what drives the decision making towards investing in seed versus series A? Is that a set of expertise or is that something that, uh, you know, the, the uncertainty part of it, which is exciting? What's the decision factor around that? I could do without uncertainty, but no, I think, look, at the end of the day, you have to do what you really like to do and you have to do what really gets you excited and what, and frankly, what you're good at. And what we've found is, you know, between Tim and myself, I mean, we really like a lot of the value is created in the earliest rounds of financing, right? And I think 
you have to know what you're good at and what you enjoy doing. And for us, we enjoy that company building at the early, early stage of it, right? And we'll talk about our CXO board here in a second. But the reality is that's the part that excites us the most. And while we've had the opportunity to do the full spectrum, we found that not only are we good at that early end of the spectrum, but we also enjoy it the most. And we find that the most value is built at that phase. So that's why we've generally focused on um, the early stage of the spectrum. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate the insights there. Um, so, you know, having raised the funds, tell us a little bit more about sort of how do you find the right company to invest in? You know, you're probably getting hundreds of emails a week. How do you find the right entrepreneur, the right company to invest in? Tell us a little bit about your decision making process there. You know, you never know where the next best entrepreneur comes from. I think we do count on referrals a lot. I mean, from folks like you who, you know, understand and know great entrepreneurs around. We we have, you know, good relationships with other VCs. But that doesn't mean that someone who reaches out over LinkedIn is not going to get a connection with us, right? And And part of this is, um, we'll talk about this, but the prepared mind, right? I'm not going to, the chances of me responding to somebody who just blankets an email across, you know, because they can find our emails anywhere. It's very hard to respond to everybody who reaches out. However, if somebody's taken the trouble to say, hey, you know, I see that you guys do healthcare investments. Uh, you know, you guys have some interesting companies like Reify Health or Deep Lens. And, you know, we know so-and-so there, and, and there is some warm connection, some prepared mind. The chances of that hap- uh, that connection happening are so much higher than just a, the cold, cold call email, right? I mean, it's no different from sales or inside sales um, with companies. And so for us, um, that's kind of the how do you connect, right? But I think this, the second part of your question or embedded in your question is, What are we looking for? And at the end of the day, look, I I think if you're investing in seed and and series A companies, a lot of it has to do with the entrepreneur, right? And and there are three big buckets you think about entrepreneur, technology and markets, right? When maybe when I started, I was a little more focused on the markets um, because maybe there was some more breathing room. But now every space is, you know, a dozen or more companies and you really have to, you know, it's, it's about betting on the jockey here, right? And so for us, it's it's making sure that you you do your work on the entrepreneur and, and kind of figure out what it is about him or her that, that makes sense, right, uh, for the opportunity. So I think people use the term entrepreneur market fit a lot. And I feel like that has become even more important and relevant these days. And how much time do you spend with the portfolio companies? Does each yeah. of the member in the team kind of spend with four or five of them? Yeah. So the way to think about this, Nilima, is that for me, it's very different from when you start out a career and you don't have any baggage with you versus kind of where we are in the journey. So if, if you think about this as for me right now, I probably have eight to 10 boards and probably a dozen or so portfolio companies because we may not be on the board of every single company that we're involved with, most of them, but not all of them, right? So so call it eight to 10 boards and a dozen to 15 companies. So for me, the the real leverage at the end of the day, I, so if, if you ask me, how do I split my week or my month up? I would tell you that it's probably 45% on, on new companies, 45% on you know, existing portfolio companies and 10% for other stuff, including CXO board and, you know, LP stuff and whatever else, right? But but that was very different when I started out or for the younger principals and associates at the firm, heavily weighted towards deal sourcing. And so I would say for me, you know, off the call it half of my time that I spend with portfolio companies, even that is about where do you get the most leverage, right? So if I think about Varun at Redlock or any of this, place, for me, it was mostly about helping build a team. What are the team requirements? Because the only way entrepreneurs and CEOs scale is with, is with their team. And so a lot of our efforts are helping entrepreneurs, not just find talent, but really kind of interview and help them make sure, especially first time entrepreneurs, making sure they're finding the right fit of talent for their companies. And that was one of the things I learned with Sourcefire was, 
you know, I mean, that company went from pre-revenue in Marty's basement to almost a billion dollars of revenue at Cisco. And, um, you know, it was that team that we hired there stayed intact for a good part of 10 to 12 years as they grew that business. And I learned a lot from, you know, some of the executives there. So I think it's that's where we spend our time on the existing portfolios is really around team, custom interactions, all the stuff that VCs will tell you about. We're very good at that. But I think the biggest part for me is is making sure that the team scales with the entrepreneur. Yeah, it's a per- perfect segue into kind of the the main portion of the part where we wanted to talk about your hits, your losses, and your misses, right? So obviously, source fire was a big hit. Tell us a little bit about obviously what you saw early on and how you know the source fire team and the leadership team were executing. What did they consistently get right? What are the, some of the consistent themes you're finding in the hits you have seen, whether it's Sourcefire, Redlock, and other companies? What do they get right across the board? Yeah, so I, I would say, look, there are cases, and we can go a couple through a couple examples where you know the market just drags everything in the right direction. But most of the time, I would say, it's about that entrepreneur who's been able to look around the corner. And not just down the road, but around the corner, because if you think about the big companies and what they're interested in, or big public markets, uh, it's about someone who could see things that the rest of us mortals could not see for another three or four years, right? So if I think about Marty at Sourcefire, so what Marty did was, I mean, he had this open source project called Snort, which was in the intrusion detection space. And back in 2002, Thinking about putting open source and security together was like, you know, fire and ice, right? Because you think about open source, well, everybody can look at the code and do whatever. And security is supposed to be this very secretive thing, right? And being able to put that together and Marty had that vision around how he was going to get it out there. We had 2 million downloads of Snort. We had big enterprises using and just wanting to pay for it. And this was in 2002 when there were only a couple other Red Hat and MySQL were the only other open source things. Now everything's open source. Everybody wants to use it. Everybody, every VC is chasing the next hot open source project. But I think back in the day, it was Marty being able to see around the corner, right? And so I think for us, it's those entrepreneurs who have been able to transform industries. I'm I'm involved with a company called Reify Health, which is in the patient enrollment for clinical trials. You know, now with the pandemic, I mean, everybody's talking about how clinical trials are getting decentralized and democratized. But when Ralph started this and two or three years ago, I mean, he was really, really innovating around stuff. So it's to me, it's that entrepreneur who has that ability to look around the corner, which is really critical. Yeah. Uh, You know, one of the key things you talked about is kind of the market drives the right type of people to build the right product. And a big portion was market. But uh, keep me honest here. I mean, Marty and and the Sourcefire team must have gone through the kind of the dot-com hangover, then 08 crisis, and they sort of navigated all of this. And, you know, we always hear that, you know, in startup land, lows are lower than highs are high. Like, were there any stories that you remember where things were, whether it's source for any other company, where things were low and the entrepreneur just kind of through grit and sheer will kind of pushed the company forward? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, look, venture and, and startups are never a straight line up and to the right. I mean, I'm, it's 18 years. I'm still waiting for the first one that, that's been a straight <laughs> line. But it's, you know, the reality is that, I mean, whether it's, you know, the market corrections or whatever, right? I mean, sometimes team you know, you, you might hire an executive who didn't work out or external other external factors. To me, it's it's that's why the focus is on building a team right around an entrepreneur. And, and I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of crises that Marty faced in the early years and, and even in the later years, even as a public company, even once they went public. I mean, the first couple of quarters out of the gate were terrible. And to me, it all comes down to, you know, have you surrounded yourself with great people around you. And I think eventually there's no substitute for that. Gotcha. You know, in in the VC business, uh, one of the things that is often talked about is kind of the misses. The misses sting a lot more than the losses, right? It just kind of nature of the business. 
Uh, were there any misses, um, obviously, in, in your career? And what have you learned from that? Yeah. Yeah. How much time do we have? I mean, <laughs> a long list, of, long list of misses. Look, I mean, I, I think what I'll try to do is give you a couple examples that highlight different, different situations, right? And, and probably two in the same bucket, I would say, and different size and scale of outcome. I remember there was a company, AdMob, which is in the mobile advertising space. And I'm not an advertising guy, but I remember this was in probably 2007 or eight or something. I can't remember when, but somewhere around that time frame when Omar was a freshman at Wharton Business School doing his MBA. And, you know, I found him through some blog post somewhere and I reached out to him and he was like, Mark, I'm looking to raise $300,000 Here's, I, it was probably the most thoughtful business plan I have ever seen in 18 years of doing this. And it was, you know, 20 page doc and it was all the details. There was lots of metrics, lots of data. And I was like, damn, this is a no brainer. And I, I remember, and I'd been doing this for about five years as a VC and, and I remember taking them to the team and, and Sierra at the time was a much bigger team and more senior established partners. And Unlike Sourcefire, where I knew security very well and I had the conviction to tell everybody, guys, we got to do this deal. I didn't know much about mobile advertising. And, and I remember one of my partners telling me, this guy should just focus on business school. Why is he doing this mobile advertising thing? And anyway, long story short, I mean, we, you know, we didn't write that $300,000 check. And the other dimension was also, you know, back in the day, nowadays, people drop $300,000 in the lunch line at, at white Combinator <laughs> events, right? Um, back in the day, that's like 300,000 was like, well, why does somebody want 300,000 bucks? Right. And, and so long story short, Omar went on to build a phenomenal company. It was the first real big mobile advertising company, sold it to Google for 750 million. It is a key part of, you know, Google's mobile ad business. And we just missed it because I, I couldn't see around the corner on that. And I didn't have the conviction and in doing spaces and and you know so that was one example and and similar in that bucket would be instacart i remember we saw one of the principals at sierra brought in instacart uh, right out of yc and apur was just i mean phenomenal phenomenal he had found his way into yc he had found his way you know and, and and people didn't see it and but at the end of the day he struggled to raise right out of yc and and you know we missed that opportunity and and this story hasn't fully been written yet, but that's, you know, a massive company. And so for us, it's that ability to kind of take the risks and areas and spaces that you may not know everything about, right? And, and it's a calculated risk. But then if you play this forward to spaces I know a lot about, sometimes, you know, we saw Palo Alto Networks. I mean, when Nero was raising a Series B, I think, I mean, we were conflicted a little bit because of source fire at the time, but you know, different funds. And if there was really a way, we'd have probably done it. But I would just say for different reasons, whether it's valuation or, you know, there's something about the entrepreneur that, oh, maybe I can't, we don't identify with this person or we don't get along or something. I, I think to me, it's, it's, there's a long list of reasons why you can't do a deal. What I've learned over time is in the venture business, you always have to look at what could this company be? not what could go wrong. And I think too often we get caught up in the what could go wrong. You know, eventually it, those have come back to bite me. For the entrepreneurs, Mark, who are listening to this or would be entrepreneurs, what is a good way to show that vision to you? The opportunity around the corner, maybe it's something that's not in a space that you are investing in today, but you may want to invest in. Yeah. So, you know, no, my, I would say that for me, I really I become a big, big believer in what I call full stack entrepreneurs. You know, you, you, you guys talk about, you know, full stack developers and stuff, but I think there are full stack entrepreneurs, full stack entrepreneurs are people who can essentially talk to customers, who can talk to investors, who can talk to their team, who can you know, talk a bit about the product, but also can talk about, you know, the market and the market opportunity. So for me, for me, you know, if I'm looking at, well, let me say what I'm looking for, what entrepreneurs should keep in mind is that ability to, too often people come in and tell you what you, what they have versus what customers want. And and I'm not a technical guy. I mean, I yes, I have a robotics degree, this, that, and all, but I can't hold my own. And you know, deep technical conversations, right? And so 
For me, it's more about product market fit. So the first thing I'd say in the full stack entrepreneurs, know your audience, right? Someone needs to know, hey, this is a guy who invests in these spaces. This is what he's invested in security or in healthcare. So let me come in prepared on that front. And then be able to talk about the market opportunity, the product market fit, where they are. So I will. I, I rarely do two guys or two gals in a, in a PowerPoint presentation, but I, I definitely want to see what market discovery they've done. You know, what have they figured out the ideal customer profile? I'm not looking for revenue or traction or how many customers do you have given the stage we're investing, but I'm definitely looking for what kind of customer discovery has someone done? Do they have it? Even if I think about Varun and Redlock, I mean, Varun had a couple customers that were kicking around his product and, and that was it. And and we literally met and we can dive into this in a little more detail. We met at a bar and we sat at a table and within 45 minutes, I was like, I'm going to invest in this guy because he just could articulate the product market fit, how this is going to be a big company, how he was going to get there, what kind of people he needed to get there. I mean, to me, that's what I mean by full stack entrepreneurs. So somebody who's not just in love with their own product, but the ability to kind of think through the full stack. Very well said. Never heard of the full stack entrepreneur before. Uh, be sure to use that. Uh, thank you for that. We talked about the hits, obviously. We talked about the misses. What have you learned from the losses? So obviously you invested in the entrepreneur, the market and the company. So things were pretty good. Like, you know, that led you to make the investment. Is it the scaling phase typically between like seed and A or A and B where things start to kind of like, you know, get a little shaky for these people, the execution risks? What have you seen from the, you know, companies that just couldn't make it on the other side beyond the macro environment, which obviously entrepreneurs can't control? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, in the broad category of, of issues that I've seen, right, one is market risk. And when I say market risk, I really truly mean like, you know, the market changed on you. Something happened, whether it was regulatory, whether it was, I, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of things that could change in the market, right? And good teams can see that earlier than most people and navigate there. But I feel like the other part of it is the part that's, I would separate this into stuff that's in your control and stuff that's not in your control. The stuff that's under your control is the execution risk and hiring and firing and all those pieces of it. And to me, where sometimes you just wait too long on making changes in the team or whatever else, right? And you got to help the, the founder or the CEO kind of see what's necessary to some extent, right? Because we're not running the companies, but we've got to be able to, you know, see what's going on and be help, helpful to the teams to adapt to those situations. So I would say half of the stuff that, that hasn't worked out is, is market risk related. I mean, just Facebook happened or, you know, whatever, right? I mean, there's, there's certain things that just beyond your control. And yes, you should have seen it and maybe you should have exited earlier, but don't need to get into those details. I think the, the part that, you know, I feel probably has been places where I've gotten burned is where we've not been able to adapt on the execution uh, risk side of it and adapt soon enough. And that's a very slippery slope because as you know, I mean, these windows of opportunity are getting narrower and narrower. And if you don't execute, the, the world passes you by. Yeah, great insights there. I, I want to switch now a little bit more in the future in terms of the market landscape over the next five years besides healthcare and infrastructure what are some of the other hot b2b trends that we may see i think you're getting specialized in every area right so as you as you look at i mean very broadly and this is doesn't do it justice if you split it into infrastructure and applications right i mean on the infrastructure side you've seen how security has become while it's the gift that keeps giving I feel like, you know, it's specialized down to application level, you know, source or infrastructure, uh, network related stuff. I mean, it's it's very, very fine tuned and, and you have to really thread the needle on, on some of these things, right? I think on the application side, the way we've looked at it is by vertical. And so whether it's healthcare or manufacturing or whatever else, and then by function. Now you're beginning to see companies that just focus on sales engineering or inside sales or 
I mean, it's, it's down to those granular levels because each of these companies, each of these constituencies have buying power. And so you just need to be able to figure that out. So I think as we map that matrix out, it's kind of saying, where are these next big things? So if, if I think about healthcare, for instance, we've kind of gone down and said, hey, this payer and provider and, and all these, by the way, are all B2B stuff, right? But mm -hmm. it's not just healthcare. It's like within that, you're kind of saying, how do the payers work? How do the providers work? You know, should you go after the pharmaceutical world? I mean, where in that equation? And within that, you start saying, okay, clinical trials and each of these areas get very, very granular. And so for us, it's it's just, you can't spread yourself through thin because I think it's, you know, with a fund our size, uh, yes, we're making a lot of early stage bets, but I still do believe that there are certain areas that you're just better qualified than other folks. And so I try to be competitive in a handful of few areas. Yeah, you've touched upon healthcare a couple of times. And I think obviously Peter Thiel said like in the last 50 years, we haven't seen real innovation. Obviously, I think with the RNA based vaccines, you know, in material science and real you know, healthcare stuff, we are seeing some innovation. What are some of the technology trends in healthcare? I mean, above and beyond, I guess, telehealth that gets you super excited. Yeah. So, I mean, I just did a session with Gartner and with their Gartner Research Board, and we had like about a dozen of the top CIOs and CTOs and chief digital officers of these, you know, across the spectrum, like Amerisos, Bergen, or Merck, and some of the, like whether it was pharma, payer, provider, across the spectrum. And I, I think, you know, there are a few big trends. I think one of the biggest things that's happened with this pandemic is we're going to see this decoupling. I use the term of decoupling of assets from services, right? So everybody thinks about healthcare as telehealth, right? Okay, I go, my doctor's visit is now going to be a video conference, and that's what it is. But it's way more than that. I think you're going to get a lot of the remote monitoring. You're going to get a lot of the diagnostics. You're not going to have to go into your doctor's office to get some of that stuff done. So I think that is, and you've, you've seen this a little bit with, you know, the Teladoc merger, right? And, and so I, I think as you think about the different components, and it's, it's massive, I think with a Amazon getting into this, it's going to completely change the landscape here. But to us, we're kind of saying we're not biology, PhDs in biology, right? So we're not going to do some of the life sciences oriented thing. We're kind of saying, hey, where do you apply technology to, you know, healthcare business problems? And that's how we've approached it. And that's why we were like, hey, reify for clinical trials totally makes sense. You know, it's basically Google Docs on steroids, it's workflows. You know, it could be applied to any space. It could be applied to manufacturing, could be applied to it. We just think that the fit in this particular area within patient recruit, patient enrollment for clinical trials is a big space. So that's why we made that investment. There are tons of opportunity, but you have to figure out what you do best. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of digitization of the different healthcare processes. Speaking of Amazon and even Microsoft consolidating infrastructure, foreign into the security space, what is the impact you see Microsoft getting serious about horizontal layers, which it was not before? What would be the impact on the kind of opportunities that entrepreneurs will have? Because one fine day, Google may say, I will add Google tables and a lot of productivity tools become obsolete. Yeah, look, I mean, this comes to entrepreneurs who can see around the corner, Nilamar, because I do feel like at the end of the day, if you kind of worry about what Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are going to do. There's very, very little white space, right? You just have to figure out what can you do better than them in the period of time that you have, right? I mean, they're, in particular, Microsoft, to some extent, Google, right? They're very acquisitive on, on stuff, right? And and you just have to be able to thread the needle or run the gauntlet, you know, better than them, right, on, on some of the stuff. But I, I really do feel like there's a ton of opportunity, and especially as you start getting into different verticals, because... Yes, they do have a lot of horizontal plays, but if I think about healthcare, I think about some of these other spaces, they are going to get into these spaces, but they're going to do it inorganically, right? And so to me, there's, there's tons of opportunity right now. And it's and by the way, it's, it's not just Microsoft and Amazon. I'll give you one example. I'm on the board of a company called Yalo Chat, which is basically conversational AI, but based out of Mexico City, 
focused on LATAM and Asia. And it's essentially, it's all based on WhatsApp and mostly WhatsApp, right? Messenger and a few other things, but mostly WhatsApp in geos that are where WhatsApp is the strongest. And to me, they are running the biggest businesses in these geos on WhatsApp. They're providing applications on top of WhatsApp that are running FEMSA, which is Coke's bottle, gazillion dollar bottling business. They're running airline industries. They're l- running hospitality. And this company is one of the fastest growing portfolio companies for us. And it's this whole digitization through the pandemic has just accelerated everybody. So to me, I feel like there are going to be these opportunities. I think there are companies like Salesforce and ServiceNow, which are now very, very large companies that are going to, they will compete and they are competing with Microsoft and Amazon and Google in different areas. So I think there's lots of M&A activity that will happen over time. And I think the best companies will go public as you're seeing that already. So I think there are tons of opportunities for us. It's it's trying to figure out which ones are kind of, you know, can be large companies, right? There are a lot of t- tech and acquisitions, but we're, we're trying to find those those big ones. Well said. There's a fair bit of uh, froth in the market. Uh, it's been like that for a few years now and, and it feels like dot com. Uh, when do you think the music stops? Hey, that's why I'm in venture. I'm not in <laughs> my old job in Wall Street. I, I have no idea, Ankur. I, I, yeah. You know, when I, I thought it would have tapered off a little while ago. But look, I think with interest rates where they are, the equity markets are very vibrant. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Nobody could have forced you know, could have seen what the mortgage stuff did back in 2008. Nobody could have seen. I, you just can't predict. And that's why I believe in managing what you can control and the stuff that's beyond your control is really hard to tell. Well said. Last question before we move on to the rapid fire. We see business from the outside. It looks like a cool thing. Meeting a whole bunch of people, investing in a lot of company. What advice would you have for somebody who wants to get into the business? It's a hard business. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, um, look, I've, I've done this for 18 years. I've seen the transition, you know, the phases uh, in the venture business. And, and it's it's a fun business in the sense of the fun part of this business is you get to meet the smartest people. You get to see the best ideas. All of that is is terrific. I think the hard part in it is, you know, like I was saying, I have eight to 10 portfolio companies and, you know, or boards, and then, you know, probably a dozen to 15 investments across the board. And at any given time, there are more companies who have problems than companies who are doing well. <laughs> and and these are emotional. These are teams. These have become, many of the entrepreneurs have become friends and you're trying to work with them closely. And it's hard. I mean, because their problems are my problems. And it's that emotional attachment being able to separate some of it out, but the reality is when companies have gone through rough times, I mean, you you think about it and you you try to help the entrepreneurs out. And it's it's difficult when you, you know, that's the part that people don't see from the outside. It's those, those ups and downs. And as an entrepreneur, your entire life is around one company. For us, it's, you know, times a dozen. So it it is uh it's challenging but it's also fun and and so when you actually have a a good moment or a happy moment there you you got to embrace it you got to take full advantage of it and you got to celebrate those those ups at the end of the day. So it's um I love it. I've I, you know I had three jobs or four jobs and two master's degrees in my first 10 12 years of my career and I've done the same thing now for 18. So I guess I like it. Great. With that, uh, we'll go into the last round, which is the rapid fire round. Uh, Book of the year. There are lots of books, but for me, my guilty pleasure is cooking. I love to cook. So I'm reading this book right now called Chocolate, A Bittersweet Saga of Dark and Light. It's not just about the story of chocolate, but the background. It's like blood diamonds and whatever else. So it's that it just it's a guilty pleasure and escape for me. Awesome. Entrepreneur of the year. Well, if you follow time, it's it's got to be, uh, you know, what Zoom has done. So, Eric. <laughs> Company of the year. I would say Zoom too. But, you know, I, I look, I, I actually do think that companies like Viva and ServiceNow 
have also made a tremendous difference. Um, so I, I would probably not just say Zoom because I gave it to Eric, but I'd say ServiceNow and, and Viva. Event of the year, aside from COVID, of course. <laughs> Is there anything else left? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's got to be the elections, right? <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Is there going to be a Google and B2B security space anytime soon? You know, I think companies like Palo Alto have done a phenomenal job. So I don't think there's going to be a Google, but I think there's going to be a lot of great companies. If you could name an entrepreneur we should invite on the pod. If you can get Ralph Passarella from Reify to do it, he is he's changing clinical trials forever. And so I would, I would just because I know him, I know his mission, I would encourage you to try to get to Ralph. He's just very busy. And last question, one advice you'll give your 18-year-old self? Don't have a plan. Just go with the flow. With that, Mark, we want to thank you for your time. We learned a lot and we're really hopeful that in a year or so, we'll be able to invite you on our pod again. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate the time. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you very much.